There was a lot of interest in last week's video about Unity playables, so this week we're going to go a little further and continue that topic by exploring the playable behavior class. A playable behavior allows you to define logic for playables within a playable graph. So today we'll cover playable behavior, script playables, audio clip playables, and scene object references using the exposed reference class to add footstep sounds to our local motion. Beyond that, we're also going to take a quick look at using the new awaitable class as an alternative to coroutines. Let's get started. So last week we used the playable graph to create a small animation system that can handle locomotion as well as playing one-shot animations that were coming in from objects in the scene. What we're going to build today is going to require that the animation system knows a little bit more about the world. So let's keep all the configuration related to animation in its own configuration object. We can just move all the constructor parameters up into here. So that's the animator, the idle clip, and the walk clip. We might as well do the same thing right now for any audio config we want to set up in our animation system. So right below this, I'm just going to make another one. For our audio config, we need to have an audio source that we're going to play clips out to. And for now, the only sounds I need are footstep sounds. So we can just pass that in as an array. So let's jump back to the player class and just quickly make some changes there so that we have these references exposed to Unity. Where I previously had these animation clips as public fields, let's instead have public references to these two config objects. I'm also going to require a component of type audio source on this player class. And then rather than managing these things manually, let's have an onValidate method. If the animator's null in its config, let's get component for that. If the audio source is null in the audio config, let's get component for that too. Now there's no point in having a class member for the animator. Let's remove that and let's also remove the call to get it in the start method. Now we just have to fix up this constructor. So instead of passing these individual things into the constructor, let's pass in our two configuration objects. Now we can just go and clean up the animation system constructor. Not much to do here. Let's just fix up the signature. I'll just replace it quickly here. And then everywhere that we were referencing the animator or the idle clip or the walk clip, we just have to prefix that with the correct configuration object. Okay, that should make the whole system a little bit easier to work with. If we jump back over to Unity now, you'll see these two objects are exposed to the editor. I've already filled them in with the values I want. And let's just test it out. We just want to make sure that nothing's broken. So all we really changed was where the references are stored for the different things related to locomotion. So I'm just going to walk around the scene, make sure it looks right. Looks exactly the same as before. Let's keep going. So now we're going to get into the interesting stuff. We're going to make a footstep playable behavior. This is going to inherit from a playable behavior. Now this is a class provided by Unity that has all kinds of lifecycle methods such as on graph start. We're going to make use of that in just a second. Let's start by defining some member variables. First, we're going to need references to all the audio clips that we want to use. I'll call that footstep sounds. Now audio clips are assets in the project. They're not things that have been instantiated in the scene. So we can just use a normal reference for this. However, here we also want a reference to our audio source. In order to get a reference to something that exists in the scene, we need to use an exposed reference. This is how you get access to scene objects from inside the playable graph. So we'll make an exposed reference of type audio source, and we're going to resolve that in just a moment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have a few lifecycle methods we can use. The first one is on graph start. On graph start is kind of like a mono behavior start method. It's going to run right at the beginning, and we can use it to do some setup. The first thing I want to be able to do is resolve this scene reference to the audio source we want to use. Now let's take a look quickly at what type that actually returned to us instead of using var. So as you can see, it's an I exposed property table. Now this works kind of like a dispatch table. We'll be able to query the table and get back the correct object that we're looking for. The exposed reference class has a method on it called resolve, and we can pass in this resolver that we're using for this graph and we can get back the resolved audio source. And that's what we can use within this playable behavior to actually play some sounds. Now that we have an understanding of what's going on here to resolve this exposed reference, I think we could just turn this into a one-liner. Next, let's make another public method that we could call so that we can actually play one of these footstep sounds. To save ourselves a little bit of grief, let's just have a guard clause here that'll bail out early if there's no sounds to play or nothing to play them on. Finally, in the most trivial implementation of this, since we have a reference to the audio source in the scene now, we could just play a one shot of a random sound that's in the array. Okay, that's about the simplest playable behavior I could think of that also uses an exposed reference. We're gonna elaborate on this a little bit more. 
However, first, let's go back to the animation system and find out how we can integrate this new playable behavior into our playable graph. Now, because we're going to do more setup and we've got quite a long constructor here already that seems to be performing some logic, let's refactor all of the animation setup out into its own method. I'm just going to call it setup animations and that's it. That'll clean up our constructor quite a lot and separate that logic out into its own thing. Let's write our audio setup and we'll do the same with that. First of all, up with our member variables, let's define a new member here. It's going to be a script playable that wraps up our footstep playable behavior. Now, any playable behavior that you create has to be wrapped in a script playable, and then the script playable is something you can put onto the graph. So let's come back down into the constructor now and write a little bit more code for setting this up. Now, I've decided that I'm going to send this out to a script playable output. So I'm going to create a new one of those. It needs to know about the playable graph, and it needs to have some kind of sensible name. Next, let's actually create the footstep playable. Again, this is very similar to what we did last week with the animations. Just use the static create method and put it into a variable. Now, what's different about script playables is that we can actually get that footstep playable behavior using the get behavior method. And then we can start manipulating it here in the setup. Now, the footstep sounds as straightforward because that's just an asset in our project. We can just assign the reference. But for the audio source, we have to do something a little bit different. We're going to say that it's a new exposed reference of type audio source, and we have to specify the default value. And that's because if we don't set anything explicitly in that dispatch table that we were looking at earlier, then it's going to fall back to whatever the default is. And we already know which one we want to use. That's the one that's specified in our audio config. The only thing left to do here is we have to connect the playable up to the playable output. So we just use the set source playable method. That's the exact same thing we did with the animations last week. Let's move all of this into its own method, just like we did with the setup animations. We'll call this one setup footsteps. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now we've got our playable behavior living on the playable graph, and it has a public method we could call anytime we want to play a footstep sound, but it's not exposed anywhere. So let's expose it here in the animation system with a public method. Call it on footstep. And all we have to do is go footstep playable dot get behavior dot play footstep sound. And that's it. It should play a little sound for us. Now we're going to have to do something to make sure we know when to actually play one of these footstep sounds. Let's go back over to our player. On the player, we could actually listen for an animation event. So we could have a public method here. We'll call it the same thing, on footstep, listening for an animation event. When we get the event, let's just call the animation systems on footstep event, and that'll trigger the sound for us. Now back here in Unity, I've already made a duplicate of my read-only animation so that I can make some changes to it, like adding events, but it's not connected to any game object or animator controller. So it's kind of hard to be able to preview what's going on. If you've run into this problem, one thing you can do is just connect it up to a model that actually has an empty animator. Now, I don't have an animator controller on my player, so I could drag this onto my animator component and it will make a new controller for me. And if I select my player in the hierarchy, now if I were to scrub the timeline, you'll see my player starts running around as per the animation. So I've already noted where my events are gonna be and I've already connected them up to the public method on the player on footstep. Now that works great if you need to preview something on your game object really quick, but I actually don't need the player controller because we're using the playable graph for all of this work. I'm gonna come back to the player here. I'm going to select that new controller that Unity made. I'm gonna remove it from here just by searching for none and I'll choose that. And then later on, I'll just delete that unused animator controller that it made. Okay, well, I'll be quiet for a bit. Let's see if it works. Seems pretty good so far. I would say working as intended. Okay, not bad, I'm pretty happy with that. Now, some of you may have noticed some of the objects in my scene bouncing around, and that's because I'm playing around with all-in-one Springs Toolkit. This is a great and very simple way to add juice to your project with minimal effort. It's going to be on sale for a couple more days, so I'll put a link to this in the description. Now, at this point, some of you are saying, OK, I understand this was an example to explain exposed reference and how to reference scene objects from within the playable graph. But couldn't this just have been done on a mono behavior to play these one shot sounds? And of course, the answer is yes, that would be the simple way to do it. The only reason you would want to do something like this is if you're going to consolidate everything related to the locomotion of your character 
into one system, the system being the playable graph. You can certainly take this a lot further, and why don't we do that right now? The next step in the evolution of this is to start thinking about how can we actually use the playable graph to be playing these sounds instead of doing one shots off the audio source. I'm going to add a few more members here. First of all, let's keep a reference to the playable graph, but we're also going to create a new audio mixer playable and an audio clip playable. Now these are very similar to the animation equivalents we used last week. So let's come down to the onGraph start method and start filling out these references. The playable graph we can get using the playable.getGraph method. For the audio mixer playable, let's create a new one by passing in the playable graph, and for now we'll just define it as a one-channel mixer. Maybe in the future we could add more inputs so that we could start blending sounds between terrains or something like that. Now, just like animations, we're going to want to pipe all of these out to an audio playable output. So we can use its create method, pass in the graph, give it a good name, and we'll pass in our resolved audio source here. Finally, let's connect up the mixer playable to the output. Okay, let's come down to our play footstep sound method. Now, let's comment this out because we're not going to be playing one shot straight on the resolved audio source anymore. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to get a random clip out of our footstep sounds, and then we're going to turn it into an audio clip playable. This playable we can connect right up into the mixer. Let's check and find out if our current clip playable is valid, because if it is, we should disconnect the current one from the mixer and destroy it and get rid of that struct. And then we can connect up this new one. We can also set its input weight all the way to 1F, which is the max. Then we'll just update the reference of our current clip playable to be this new clip playable for the next time we come in here and try and play a sound. Okay, so this is a much more powerful way of using the playable graph to play audio. Before we do another playthrough, however, I want to look at one other thing in Unity. Last week there was a lot of comments about why use coroutines when we could use async operations. And the truth is, in this scenario, you could probably go either way. However, in general, async await is named that way because you're waiting for a result. You're waiting for something to happen. Usually that's user input or something like that. You're waiting for something to happen and then you continue execution. That being said, there's nothing stopping you from using Unity's new awaitable class. I just want to point one thing out here in the editor. Some people avoid async operations because of garbage collection. If we come under player settings under player, you see there is a setting in Unity for use incremental garbage collection. This is usually on by default and you should make sure that it's on because it's quite effective. There are some caveats to this, however. I advise anybody who's worried about memory optimization to actually go read through all the documentation, especially everything underneath the optimization heading. Okay, I'm not going to go any further in detail about this because memory profiling and all that's a whole other topic. Let's go see how we can replace our coroutine usage with Unity's new awaitable class for those of you who would prefer that. So last week we were blending animations using coroutines. So I'm going to comment out these two methods here that we're not going to use. And I'm going to start collapsing up these methods that are now grayed out. We're not going to use blend in, we're not going to use blend out, and we're not going to use this ienumerator blend method. And furthermore, in the method we have to interrupt one-shot animations, we don't need to kill these coroutines either. Now, at this point, we're not doing any blending at all, so I can just clear out these three methods, and we'll write something new here. Let's start with a basic blend in and out method. We'll make it an async method that returns an awaitable. So inside this method, we're going to do pretty much exactly the same thing we did last week. We're going to blend a normalized blend time value from 0 to 1. So as long as we haven't reached 1 yet, we're just going to continue adding normalized delta time here, run the blend callback, then we await the waitable's end of frame async method. When we're done that, let's call the blend callback one more time with a max value. And that's it. Now we can use this generic blend method to blend into animations and out of them. So let's do that. Let's make one more method. We'll have it also be an async awaitable method. And we'll call this blend in out. So this will take a duration for each blend and a delay between the blends. So we're just going to pass in a callback exactly like we did last week. So the first one is going to blend into an animation. When we're done this, let's just await that delay. So there's an awaitable method for this. Wait for seconds async. When that's done, we'll do the blend out. The blend out callback is just the inverse of the blend in callback. When we're finished this, we disconnect the one-shot animation from the graph. So truth be told, this is a little bit less code than using the coroutines the way we did last week. However, we haven't connected everything yet. Let's make some room by collapsing up these two methods that I just wrote. So the next thing to do here is I'm going to want to keep a reference to this awaitable so that I can cancel it if necessary. Let's add a member here to the class. I'll move this up to the top later. 
So now instead of calling these two methods that were starting coroutines, I'm instead going to call this blend in out method and store the result in this awaitable blend in out. That way, down here in the interrupt one shot method, I can get rid of this kill coroutine stuff. And instead, we can say blend in out. If it's not null, cancel it. I think the only other tweak we could possibly make here is that blend method doesn't really hold any state. Everything it needs to run gets passed in. So this can be a static method. Let's change that quickly. Okay, so functionally, this is not any different. It's just using a different system. So let's go check it out. Well, of course, it looks exactly the same, right? So I hope that was a little bit of an eye opener. I think we'll talk a little bit more about profiling and uh, garbage collection with async operations another time. It just, uh, you know, it's something to keep an eye on a little bit. Definitely don't be calling asynchronous methods every frame. It's just going to, it's going to kill you. So uh, I guess that's all I've got for you today. I think next week we'll move on to a different topic for a little while, but I do have some more ideas about playables. And I think we'll come back to this uh, definitely another time in the future. So if you have more requests around that, I can try and bundle a bunch of them into one video. Until then, don't forget that we have a pretty busy, active Discord server you can join. You can also follow me on Twitter, click the like button, and check out some of these videos on your screen. Maybe I'll see you there.